I'm sorry. I don't know if I can drink this Java anymore. So the last few years, I've been working mostly in Java and also some cloud infrastructure. I'm a backend platform engineer and I make microservices using Java. You may have heard of Java Spring. It's a common framework. Typically, I've used it for creating APIs. These are interfaces between where the data lives and the front end. One use case for them is to organize and aggregate data based on business logic so it's easier for the front end to retrieve it. Now Java is great if you need a beefy software service. The logic might be complex, the computation might be complex. Whatever you're programming in Java is probably a pretty robust application. Java is meant to be multi-threaded, so you're probably dealing with threads. Your code is also probably running on a server. This means you have to deal with containerization, configuration settings, and lots of other things. While this sounds like a lot of work, it's actually good. If you're working with a more robust or beefy application, it's nice to have access to these settings and set them appropriately so you can make your application more efficient. Now typically your software service starts as a monolith. A monolith is where all of your code lives in one code base. It's all in one GitHub repo and it contains a bunch of different features. If we take Peloton as an example, there was probably a time where the membership information, the scheduling information, the programs, the metrics, the challenges all lived in one code base. That was fine to start, but as the application gets bigger, it becomes harder to maintain. You need to break up the application into smaller features or in smaller parts. Smaller pieces are easier to deploy and maintain because the likelihood of you breaking something becomes significantly less. If you have a huge monolith, your developers might be afraid of deploying something because they could bring down the entire system just for one small change. This is where the idea of microservices comes in. You have separate code bases for each feature set. In the example of Peloton, you might have one microservice dealing with all of the membership information. So all of the operations, what can you do to those member objects, what information they contain, all of that lives in one code base. You'll probably also have another microservice that deals with the scheduling system, class schedules, how to add something to the schedule, where all that data lives and is maintained. Now there are lots of different microservices you can create, but usually they serve as a middle layer between that backend data lake and the front end. This protects the front end from sending some bad information to the back end and corrupting the data. Working at this layer in the stack is actually pretty fun because you deal with both the back end data and the front end. You also get a better perspective of what's going on. Now, most of these microservices are built with C Sharp or Java. These languages work great if you have a microservice with lots of features. But what if you have a feature or an aggregation of data that you need to do and it doesn't fit into any of your microservices? If you're in this situation, do you spin up another microservice, really a spaghetti service, just to handle this small feature? Do you continue to build that spaghetti service in Java, dealing with threads, containerization, all these configurations that you really don't care about for this small feature? That is the question. Now some might think, okay, let's do this feature or small aggregation of data on the front end. Let's give them something to do besides creating buttons. While this may seem like a good idea, it falls apart fairly easily. Let's say the company has an iPhone app, an Android app, a website, internal clients, an SMS texting tool, and other external services services that need to use this feature. If you do this feature on the front end, all of those clients or front ends have to implement it. And they might all implement it in different ways with different rules. If you did this feature on the platform side, you can make it uniform across all front ends. One place of control for your feature or aggregation of data. All the front ends would have to do is integrate with your service. They wouldn't have to worry about the actual implementation. They would just need to know where to get the data. 
This is where the idea of a dumb client or a dumb front end comes into software engineering. If you have lots of front end interfaces, the iPhone app, the Android app, the tablet app, the proprietary tool, you don't want the front end to do a ton of work. You just want the front end to render the data and have a lot of decisions about that data be made on the platform side. This gives you a more consistent experience across all your front ends because they're just rendering the contents that you send them, the data you send them. So if you have a small feature and it doesn't fit into any of your microservices and you have a lot of clients, you'll still probably build it out on the platform side. However, you may not have to use Java for this feature. Maybe it's a good testing ground for a new technology, a new language, a new platform. In fact, we're entering a new era of technology, the era of the serverless architecture. With serverless, you think about the server less. You don't have to worry about many of those different configurations. Things like Google Functions, AWS Lambda, they're popping up and they allow you to just write the code, add a trigger, and the front end can use it. In the world of the serverless architecture, now it doesn't make as much sense to use Java. Java is heavy. It requires lots of code and you don't get as much use out of it in a Lambda function. Something like JavaScript or the Node.js platform is a lot lighter. It's single threaded, which is why many developers don't use use it, but Lambda solves a lot of those issues. You can also write code much quicker than you can in Java. However, it's not strongly typed. This can make it harder to maintain. You could run into data type issues or other smaller issues that you might find annoying. In JavaScript, there are also a lot of ways to do the exact same thing. In Java, you can create interfaces and abstract classes, and these encourage contributors to follow a certain pattern that's already established in the code base. I'm unsure if JavaScript also has a way of doing this, but considering how many frameworks have popped up, I think not. In the perfect world, your code is easy to contribute to. It's easy to add features. It's easier to find those bugs. It's easier to maintain. If there are a bunch of different implementations of similar things in the code base, it can get messy pretty quickly. Now you're using a new language, JavaScript with Node.js. You're also using a new platform, serverless. This sounds like a big deal, and it is. While changing the language will change the actual code you're writing, changing the platform will change your deployment processes and your infrastructure. You also have a bunch of Java engineers that don't know Node.js. Do you fire them and go hire Node.js engineers? Well, no. And this is actually a pretty big misconception in software development. You may be really good at one language, but you'll probably have to learn another language. You can't be all in one box. As a software engineer, you're a problem solver. You're not just a Java engineer or just an Android engineer or just an iPhone developer. You solve problems with technology. Sometimes that technology will be Java on a server. Other times you'll have to learn new technology in order to solve a problem. As it turns out, we're in those other times and I need to go learn Node.js. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, subscribe, like the video, and I'll see you next time. Happy coding.